Hello everyone. This is Methods in Computational Protein Design. The intention of this lecture is to give sort of an intuition on all the methods that are available in uh, computational protein design. So first, beginning with an introduction on why we care about protein design at all. Then a brief outline on two different methods in um, protein design. One of them is the more classical approach uh, using molecular dynamic simulations. And the second one is the more modern machine learning approach. Just a caveat here, I'm not gonna be covering all of the different methods available in protein design that will be too exhaustive. Instead, I will be just focusing on the main ideas of each approach. And finally, we're gonna conclude on some uh, examples on biotech companies that have really leveraged automation um, and robotics to really scale up their synthetic biology process. So one of the uh, key ideas that I think dry lab members and in general, uh, people who study mathematics and computer science bring to a uh, wet lab team is this notion of computational thinking. I think it breaks down into three general pillars. When you, whenever you have a solution to a problem, ideally it should be generalizable in that your solution should apply for all instances of a class. For example, in your protein design problem, your algorithm should ideally work for all possible proteins, if not for all possible proteins within a particular class of proteins. The second idea is that your uh, solution should be scalable in that your algorithm shouldn't just work for a very small protein. It should also work for large proteins as well. This also connects with wet lab in that your procedure shouldn't just you know, scale well to one or two protein purification tasks, but ideally how can your procedure scale to perhaps screening tens or thousands or even millions of variants per day. The other idea that brings all of these together is that your method should ideally be uh, susceptible to automation. So especially in the protein design pipeline, ideally you want all of the tasks to be automated so that there's very little chance to introduce human error. And also again, it's, it's nice to have all of the uh, repetitive tasks automated, especially in a massively data-dependent pipeline like um, protein design. Just an overview on all of the sorts of different uh, proteins that are out there, sort of give a perspective on what proteins can do. One of these proteins I, I'm choosing to highlight is channel rhodopsin, which is sort of this protein that's found on the surface or the membranes of uh, certain cells. What it can do is that when you shine light at it, when you shine light at this, um, there's a molecule that does a cis to trans um, conformation or isomer uh, change such that it changes the conformation of the entire protein, allowing ions to pass through. And this particular protein can also be activated, you know, there are different variants of this protein that can be activated by different wavelengths of light, i.e. different colors. So you can leverage this to sort of map all of the different neurons in the brain or the activity of neurons in the brain uh, by selectively activating certain neurons. And this has really revolutionized the field of uh, neuroscience. And one of the pioneers here of this technique is uh, at Boyden at MIT. Another protein is snake antivenom. It's actually an antibody that can recognize and bind to the snake venom, which is the antigen. So out of curiosity, how does snake venom work? It actually acts as a phospholipase in particular acts as this phospholipase here. It's actually an enzyme then, because phospholipases, they cut um, this carbon oxygen bond here, breaking this away. Then 
the resulting molecule, this whole molecule here, is something that can lyse open your cell membranes. So usually before the lysing, um, this is able to be, this is a, a, phospho, a glycerol phospholipid that is found on the surface of your cells, i.e. the parts of your membrane. Now with that, with that fatty acid tail gone, this molecule acts as sort of a detergent. Now the problem with uh, snake antivenom is that it's not really profitable for these companies to make. Although it is a very serious and deadly um, ailment, especially in the tropical countries, because of this, you know, there isn't really that much of a market for, for this, um, they've decided to stop producing snake antivenom. So if you can come up with a protein that can be manufactured in a cost-effective way, then this is clearly an important uh, problem to solve. And finally, another example is MYC. So MYC is um, a transcription factor that can interact with this partner MAX, um, shown here, bound to the double helix of DNA. When bound to DNA, it acts as this um, activator, which activates the transcription of, down, of, of genes um, downstream of its uh, control. So you've got all of these effects if you have MYC in your cells. Now, all of these will lead to entry into S phase, which is DNA replication. So as you can imagine then, if you have abundant MYC in your cells, if you have too much MYC, then you will have uncontrolled cell proliferation that leads to cancer. So inhibiting unregulated MYC is a very attractive target for uh, cancer therapy, actually. Now, perhaps you can design a sort of protein that mimics the shape of DNA and that can bind to MYC. Um, this, this is, again, something that uh, protein design can accomplish. Now, the issue with protein design is that protein sequence space is enormous. I mean, what I mean by sequence space is the number of possible proteins that you can make. So if you think of this combinatorically, in every position you have 20 possible amino acids. And if you have a protein that's, say, 335 amino acids long, then you have 20 times 20 times 20 all the way uh, to 325, uh, 335. So an average length protein is actually 335 amino acids. The number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 80, just to give an idea of where that number is at. The speed of the fastest computer is 10 to 16 flops, and the second since the beginning of time is 10 to 17. So if you can imagine a situation where every single atom in the universe was doing computation at the speed of the fastest computer in the world ever since the beginning of time, you would have only explored a um, number of sequences that is 220 times magnitude less than that of uh, your whole protein sequence space. And just consider this is just for an average length protein. You have proteins that are thousands of amino acids long, protein complexes where multiple proteins can interact. So this is a huge space that there's no way you can exhaustively go through all the possible sequences. Therefore, you need some sort of clever algorithm to traverse um, or explore this sequence space to find that optimal protein that can uh, bind to your intended target or serve as a, a snake antivenom. Okay, so now we get to the classical approach to protein design. The first step in this classical approach is to make this um, confirmation that you want to study. In this case, we are looking at uh, petase, which is a plastic degrading protein in cyan, and its ligand, which is a plastic polymer in black. So Docking really means to place that ligand in, its, in the protein's active site. So this is, this is what it, it looks like. And we see um, 
sort of, it kind of fits in that pocket of the protein, but it's sort of hard to see in this animation. So let's take a look at the next slide. Now, this is the same protein, but in a different representation. It's sort of a surface uh, representation where the different colors indicate the different types of amino acids. And I think it's good to know what colors represent to what type. So just briefly, um, these blue colors uh, here are basic amino acids. Uh, these red colors here are acidic amino acids. Then these green ones here are polar amino acids. And then the white ones here are nonpolar. So you got these four categories of amino acids that you can see on the surface of the petase. And when you spin this around, you can clearly see a nice binding pocket for um, the ligand on the protein. Now, how would you verify that that is the intended binding target or how would you verify the stability of this conformation? To do that, we use MD simulations or molecular dynamics. Again, the purpose is to estimate a protein complex stability. So in our case, the stability of that petase enzyme in um, bound to the uh, plastic ligand. So the basic principle of MD is to solve for acceleration in Newton's second law. Uh, Newton's second law, F equals MA. In this case, we represent it in vector form and we do it for all N atoms in our system. This is just the second derivative of uh, position vector R. And so the second derivative with respect to time is the acceleration. What you can do is you know the mass of your atoms and you obtain the force on each of your atoms using some force field. So this is your force field V, is a function of all of the positions of your atoms in the system. So if you can imagine, you know, the distance between two, uh, two particles or two atoms can influence the forces that these two atoms experience. And then you have, imagine a system where you have N of the atoms in sort of this cloud. And the force acting on each atom is just the uh, negative gradient of your potential energy function. So not going into too much of the details, but you can look at the um, manual for the MD force field on what, of, what uh, different energy terms includes. But imagine that all of the energy terms that you know from physics are present such as like electrostatics terms or van der Waal forces, all of those are indeed present. You run the simulation at discrete time steps and this is what you get. So here we see a simulation of the same docking solution with the petase now in green and the PET ligand in pink. So right now at this time step, you can see that the conformation has indeed changed significantly from its initial uh, conformation, where the sort of the active site of the petase is opening up and uh, adopting or adapting to the ligand on its active site. And we see it is quite stable because at this point, the ligand is not really, at, at least visually, it is not um, fluctuating or moving uh, rapidly. But you can see this more quantitatively through uh, what is known as RMSD plots. So you can plot the root mean square deviation of your backbone atoms to see how much they deviate from your initial structure to assess the stability of your complex or of your protein. So this is a very generalizable method. Right now, I'm just showing you an example of petase with its ligand. You can generalize this to any sort of protein-protein interaction or even just a single protein to assess the stability, right? Before you uh, optimize for any sort of function, you at least have to make sure that your design protein is stable. And that is like the preliminary step to doing anything else. So MD simulations is certainly a very useful tool for that.
Okay, this will be included in a separate video. I will show you some basic commands on using this uh, VMD software, which is incredibly useful in visualizing the proteins that I just showed you in the last few slides. So it is visual molecular dynamics, VMD. Well, then you can imagine that you can also view MD trajectories with this software. So um, there are some basic keyboard controls that I've listed on this slide and um, useful commands that you could use, but I definitely recommend you um, just looking at the video I have on VMD just to see some very uh, some common commands uh, that you could use to manipulate your proteins and visualize them on the computer. Now that you've assessed the stability of your um, protein docking solutions or your protein-protein interactions, perhaps you want to improve the stability of that. One of the uh, common design algorithms in classical protein design is Rosetta design. So the intuition behind this algorithm is that you would like to find what protein sequence corresponds to that point on the energy landscape, because the lower the energy, the more stable your protein is. But suppose that your wild type protein is not the most stable one. It's somewhere here. Ideally, you would want to traverse this terrain in a smart way to find the global minimum as fast as you can. So that's the intuition behind this algorithm. So let's see how it works. Suppose you have a protein sequence here denoted by theta. It is composed of N plus one amino acids, where every amino acid is sort of represented by a number between one and 20. Now, you start off with T equals to T max. It's a high temperature, and you gradually cool your system to T min, your low temperature. Why are we considering temperature here? This is a simulated annealing algorithm, which is sort of based on this idea in metallurgy, where you start off uh, with a high temperature in metals, and when you gradually cool them in controlled steps, you can make the metal uh, stronger. Now, here what we do is you consider your previous best sequence, theta t minus one. Then you sample around a small area denoted by this variance term sigma. You sample around that previous best to obtain your new proposal sequence, theta hat. Then you're going to assess the energy of that new proposal. Compare that with the energy of your previous best sequence. Now, if this energy term is less than zero, that means your new energy term is lower that energy of your new proposal sequence is lower. That means you found a better sequence. You found a more stable sequence. So theta t, your current best sequence, is going to, you accept that proposal, you accept that theta hat, and you let that be your current best. Otherwise, you look at line seven. This should be, there should be a negative sign there. So in this case, when you reach line seven, it means that your proposal sequence is not better than your previous best. It may actually be worse, but we may accept that worse sequence anyway, because if you look at this line here, if you do the math, when theta, when, uh, when t is high, the probability of this being true is greater. So when t is high, it's more likely that you can, you're going to accept your new proposal sequence, even though it may be a bad one. Even though it is, it's not going to improve your uh, current best. But when t gets lower, this line, the likelihood of that being true is less. So as t is, uh, gets lower and approaches t min, then you're less and less likely to accept sequences that don't actually improve your um, energy. But if both of these cases fail in line 9, we're simply going to reject our proposal sequence and keep our previous best. Then the idea is to loop back to our starting point. You sample a new sequence, assess the energy, 
accept or reject, and then uh, draw a new sequence based on the previous best sequence, and so on. So it's actually uh, been proven that if you start with a sufficiently high temperature T max, and if your interval, if your cooling steps uh, for uh, when you get from T max to T min, those steps are sufficiently small enough, then well, it's uh, theoretically proven that you can indeed reach the uh, global minimum in this case, or global optimum for a general case. Now, the issue with using Rosetta and using MD for protein design is that it's perhaps limited to only a few uh, optimization goals. So I talked about uh, optimizing for stability by looking at the energy. It's very difficult to assess the function of a protein that is not just the stability. How about the plastic degrading protein? How about enzymes in general? Are you, it's very difficult to assess the function of an enzyme because those reactions occur perhaps on the microsecond or even millisecond time scale. But in MD simulations, um, using current technology, we can probably assess upwards to a few microseconds, and that would take weeks. That takes weeks of computation in uh, supercomputers. So how can we design a perhaps more general optimization uh, pipeline such that given any arbitrary function, arbitrary function, can we design a better protein to optimize for that particular function? So this is opti uh, protein optimization with machine learning. First, you generate some sequences using a generative model. This will be trained on your, uh, the set of mutants available in the scientific literature. So this sort of represents the current state of what the scientific community knows about what mutations can work for a particular protein. Then you score these generated sequences from your generative model. The point of this is to assess which, uh, which protein sequences are more likely to succeed in that function that you're optimizing for. We have this generative model here, rather than using um, completely uh, strictly constricting ourselves to MD, because such a neural network can generalize to any function. So this could be our protein sequence, and this could be, for example, the brightness of uh, green fluorescence protein, which would be difficult definitely to assess using MD simulations. And then third, we modify the data generating distribution of our machine learning algorithm. So we take the top scoring sequences and you feed it back to our training set for our generative model. The idea behind that is as you iterate this loop multiple times, our training set will become more biased towards those sequences that are predicted to perform well by our um, scoring neural network. So the caveat of this pipeline is that you need a sufficiently accurate um, discriminative model or a, su a sufficiently accurate scoring function in order to um, have a, enough confidence in that your generated sequences is indeed predicted, is indeed going to have a, um, a good activity in the lab. So this is a great resource for you to get a look into some of the um, dissections of a neural network. It really shows you what components a neural network is made of. Um, and I think it is a good introduction in at least um, intuitively on what a neural network does. So just briefly, what a neural network does is a series of uh, linear multiplications that's organized in using matrices, followed by some nonlinear activation functions. And you organize these layer after layer, so you have an input in the beginning and an output at the end. It really is an input-output machine um, with multiplication and addition in between. So 
each neuron, what a neuron means is just a sum. So let's, for example, consider this neuron. Then let's suppose uh, we have W1 corresponding to this orange line approaching it, and you have W2 corresponding to this blue line approaching it. So this neuron, what that means is really a activation function. So in our case, it's actually 10H, an activation function applied on a dot product. So it's essentially W1, X1, X1 is this thing right here, plus W2, X2, X2 is this input right here, plus some optional bias term, scalar term B. That's really all there is. So that's the case for every single neuron here. We have four of them. That's also the case for each of these neurons. But the input to these neurons are going to be the output of those in the previous layer. So you can compose them layer by layer. The purpose of an activation function like this, tan h, is to introduce nonlinearities in your, in your prediction. So here we can see our output sort of is doing a classification problem where we're classifying blue dots and orange dots. If you don't include that activation function, this is never going to work because you can't, you can't use um, strictly linear functions to indicate a circular uh, decision boundary. So you can play around with this. Um, the link is there below. Uh, you can change some of the parameters uh, using these buttons here. You can also change the number of layers, changing the data set here, also tuning the uh, neural network using these sort of hyperparameters. The other idea that I want to explore in machine learning applied to protein sequence uh, design is this idea of a latent space. So I think there's a lot of promise in this area of research because at least for some of the ideas in image processing um, or computer vision, you get a lot of interesting um, things happening in the latent space. So here what you're seeing is the TSNI plots of the latent space of this model called Big GAN. GAN is a neural network that generates, can generate data. In this case, it's generating pictures of everyday objects. So what a TSNI representation does is a sort of compresses high dimensional space into a 2D plot. Um, TSNI is spelled T-S-N-E. You can look that up for more information if you want to. So what that means is if two dots are close together, well, sort of there in that latent space, the algorithm or the, um, the neural network thinks that there is some sort of commonality between those two uh, data points. So you can see that it's actually clustering things pretty well. You've got animals uh, to the top left in both of, both of these cases. Um, you've got sort of dogs being a subset of that right here. And you've got more um, everyday objects to your bottom right. Now, what's really cool about this latent space is that you can interpolate. What I mean is that you pick any two points. So suppose, well here, let's just pick cello and a drumstick. You can interpolate, uh, you draw a line between those two points and generate images for the um, latent vectors that correspond to those points on that line. So you can, I don't know, you can draw a line between airliner and a cockroach. Then you can interpolate drawing a line between those two. And for every line, you can, uh, for every point on that line, you can generate a new image just by the virtue of the, but just by using the neural network. In this case, it's a big GAN. So I'll show you some examples on the next slide. Here is just the mathematical equation that uh, you use for interpolation. Suppose you have some vector E1, some other vector E2, a line between those two points, 
is just simply expressed as a linear combination of those weighted by um, this term alpha. It's sort of like taking an average of those two points. You take maybe point one of E1, and that means you would take you would take uh, point nine of E2. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the images. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this slide just because I think it's very interesting. What's going on is you get a vector. So, uh, so here we have a hen and then you get another vector. Here we have a pizza. So you get those two latent vectors in that latent space. You generate images from those latent vectors, but you're interpolating between those two vectors. So every image you see in between is that path, that line in between the hen and the pizza. You're generating images based on those latent vectors. Then what you really see is sort of this visual transformation, this metamorphosis from a hen into a pizza. Some of the more stunning images you see are maybe uh, this one and uh, these, these three. Right, it's really, I mean, it's so convincing. It's sort of like a, a fried chicken combined with um, a tomato sauce on top. Just to look at some of the other images, you know, you can make strawberries, um, pizza, pizza topped with strawberries. What's so interesting here is that um, the model realized that, you know, probably to looked at look at the uh, distribution of pepperonis on the pizza you would need just more than one strawberry right then you have multiple strawberries um, uh, what i did here is combine the crock pot with a lobster then you actually come up with cook lobster um, well actually some of these ones as well and then the right three are slightly more disturbing ones. Um, I encourage you to look at some of the uh, details if you wish. The most disturbing one is actually the one saved at the bottom right. That is a combination of a king crab with a, a Mexican hairless dog. So uh, another very cool example of exploring latent space is this uh, example right here. Um, I will provide the link to this. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's on the slide, but what it does is at every corner of this square of this grid is a musical or rhythmic theme. And when you run it through the generator, it's going to generate actually these beats, these drum beats. So then you do the same thing similar to the big GAN, you do interpolations. So here, rather than two points, you have four points. And so everything along this line is gonna be sort of an average between this musical theme and this musical theme. The coolest part is that you can draw a trajectory along this latent space, like this. And this uh, circle is going to sort of traverse all of these grids along this latent space. And for every grid, it's going to generate a new theme that is sort of look, looking at the average um, of all of these four points based on that position of the grid. So how can we relate this to proteins? They've already done this for molecules. Uh, this is the latent space of a generative model uh, for these small molecules that are potentially possible drug candidates. So like, you look at the latent space, again, you can make interpolations. But why is it useful? Well, perhaps you can find a molecule like this that has good catalytic activity, a, a good protein that has good catalytic activity. And you can also have a protein with good thermal stability. So what if you interpolate between the two proteins? you can perhaps imagine that somewhere along this line there could be a protein that combines the properties of both good catalytic activity and good thermal stability. So even more uh, pushing the envelope a bit further, 
you know, we could similar to the music example have four corners and you can sort of traverse that latent space by having sort of an average of all of those four um, properties. So good thermal stability, good solubility, good catalytic activity, and perhaps um, good expression rate or good secretion out of your cell. Now, what use is a generative model without a discriminator that can tell you how good that generated sequence is? It's really no good at all. So we need a sufficiently accurate sequence to function model. And so this video right here shows sort of the sequence to function landscape of the green fluorescence protein. And you know, the height of the, of the landscape shows how bright that protein is. And the further out you go, the more mutations you accumulate. So as expected, the more mutations you accumulate, um, you see a greater loss of function. Then the idea of a, a sequence to function model is to uh, sort of fit this landscape where you have protein sequence and you predict protein function. If you want to look at the code in training a, a GFP sequence to function model, you can go to this link here. Um, it's essentially a Google Colab notebook on training an entire sequence to function model from parsing the data from an Excel file and assessing the uh, model performance. So I encourage you to try this out. One of the problems with training a sequence to function model is the case when you don't have a lot of data. When you don't have a lot of data, it's very difficult to train a uh, sequence to function model that performs well. More importantly, it's hard to tell if your model is going to generalize to unseen data. Uh, so last year for our PETES uh, project, we had 19 uh, sequences uh, of mutations of PETES that we had access to in the literature. But rather than giving up on uh, a machine learning approach, we found a data set of GFP sequences um, that contained over 50,000 unique sequences uh, that map corresponding to their brightness values. So what we can do is um, first train our neural network on a large data set, then fine tune uh, some of the last few layers on our smaller data set. And this technique has been applied in computer vision, where if you were to try to train a model uh, to predict possibility of a rare disease from an x-ray image or a CT image, that's going to be very challenging because you don't have a lot of uh, data points for such a rare disease. Uh, but you do have a lot of cat pictures online. So you can first train your model on these millions of cat pictures. Then the first few layers of your model are going to uh, probably detect edges or curves and then only the last few layers will be for higher level abstraction. So then you can read to, uh, so you can fine tune those last few layers for your particular problem. So one of the caveats of this approach is that you need to be careful um, what domain you're transferring knowledge from. In our case, it's kind of a black box. Um, we're trying to transfer um, knowledge learned from GFP sequences to PETES and their different properties. GFP is brightness and PETES is catalytic activity. So definitely more in-depth investigation needs to take place in order to see what features are actually being transferred in uh, using this technique. So I talked about generative models and uh, discriminative models. One way to couple these two together um, that is separate from that loop you saw in the machine learning uh, design pipeline is to consider this idea known as active learning. But before talking about active learning, we need to talk about an exploration exploitation trade-off. This is the idea of deciding where to go for dinner. Um, it's an analogy that can be very useful to think about. So say you want to go for dinner and you have your usual place, but you also see there's a new place. The problem is with either of these choices, you have a trade-off. If you go to the usual place, you risk 
not trying the new restaurant. You might be missing something better. If you go to the new restaurant, um, you risk you know, not choosing your previous usual place, which you know is good. Um, going to that new restaurant risks it being bad. So this is a conundrum. How should we decide uh, which path to take? One way to balance the exploration exploitation trade-off is through a framework that is known as GPUCB, uh, which stands for Gaussian Process Upper Confidence Bound. But before talking about what this is, um, just a bit of intuition on what this active learning really means. So this is a bit different from the sequence to function models um, that I talked about earlier in that you're actually going to actively add in new data points using this method. So what you do is that you first fit a sequence to function model. Here the red dots uh, are data points. So suppose you had these sequences and you already know their function from the literature. You fit a GP, then you obtain this curve. What this curve is uh, in green, these are your predictions. So say you have a sequence here, then your prediction is going to be somewhere around that. So that's going to be a predicted fitness value. Now, the gray area around that green curve is your uncertainty. So that is uh, what GP, what Gaussian processes can give you, an uncertainty for each predicted value. The point of active learning is to use this information to pick a data point that you want to explore next. So I don't know, let's suppose we pick this sequence. So that's going to have a predicted value here, but you know it has an uncertainty to it. So our goal, uh, the point of active learning, is to actually synthesize that sequence in the wet lab. They're going to do their, their magic, they're going to come back around a week or so, hopefully, and give us the actual experimental measurements of the sequence fitness. That will, well, it's probably not going to be exactly as predicted. It may be somewhere um, lower than that, perhaps. Then you have one more data point in your data set. You refit your Gaussian process model to this updated data set. That is the idea of active learning. Now, why did I pick this sequence? That was just random. Um, really you shouldn't be picking a sequence there. That is where we turn to this method called GPUCB. That is a method that tells you which sequence you should pick and that balances out the exploration exploitation trade-off. So what GPUCB does, well it says okay we want to explore our protein sequence space but we also want to use the information we know already of what the landscape looks like. So in this case, GPUCB will choose a point around this region. Well, because it's around this region, the model has high uncertainty. You can see here, there's high uncertainty in that region. But also, um, it has the highest uh, predictive value. So combining uncertainty with the uh, highest prediction value you sort of balance the exploration and exploitation. You explore by synthesizing new sequences and getting new data points in regions of high uncertainty. So when you actually get the results from the wet lab back, that will certainly reduce the uncertainty in this region. Now, suppose the results from the wet lab were actually here, then uh, the gray curve or the gray area around that region would definitely be updated to something that looks like that looks like this, where there is high confidence around that data point and um, low confidence elsewhere. Then that again, that green curve is probably going to update as well. It balances. It also considers the exploitation because you're picking out uh, the point with the highest predicted fitness, leveraging that information you already know about your sequence space. 
So um, the idea behind active learning then is to iterate this dry lab, wet lab procedure a couple of times um, to hopefully synthesize an even better uh, sequence than ever observed before. So now we can see uh, an animation on how an algorithm sort of maps out that Gaussian process landscape. Because we need to somehow find that point with the maximum uncertainty and also the maximum uh, predicted fitness, but it's not possible to look at all possible sequences and then calculate the fitness for each one of those. So we have to do some sort of grid search where we pick some random points on the sequence space and we figure out uh, what is the uh, predicted fitness for that particular point. We can estimate how the GP landscape works. Um, and we can see an illustration in the next few slides. So the uh, curve in blue, that suppose that's your GP landscape, and the curve in green is your current approximation of that landscape. Now let's take a look at some of the biotech companies that are doing work in protein design. The first one is just uh, distributed bio. They actually do antibody design, which is, well, it's also a protein. Um, recently, they've been in the news because of the uh, COVID-19 situation. Uh, Jake Glanville here, the CEO of Distributed Bio, he's been giving these um, interviews um, where he's describing their technique in designing an antibody that can bind to uh, the spike protein on the coronavirus. So uh, clearly very um, important uh, application area for protein design. You can see some of the methods that they use to design this antibody. Um, but essentially, you know, the video that I linked here in Instagram, it shows the idea of an autonomous uh, wet lab, sort of. They're trying to really scale up the um, experimental um, timeline in uh, protein synthesis and antibodies discovery by using these um, programmable robotics that uh, can really streamline uh, experiments and introduce, have minimal uh, points where you can introduce human error. Uh, one of the other companies that actually has their whole philosophy based on this is on the next slide. So Ginkgo Bioworks, um, based in uh, near MIT, they their whole philosophy is really to try to think of synthetic biology in terms of a car manufacturing plant like Toyota. So uh, their employees are actually required to read uh, this book called The Toyota Way, um, some management principles of you know manufacturing and how that manufacturing process is similar to a Synbio um, startup or a Synbio manufacturing process. Again, their philosophy is really to introduce as little uh, human intervention in that wet lab um, as possible in that they have these programmable um, stations where you have uh, interfacing with the scientists are these monitors and essentially all of the instructions for the robotics for the robotics are uh, programmed um, into these computer interfaces so here's a video I, I encourage you to watch it if uh, if you have the time it's by the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks and they're doing some amazing stuff with um, protein synthesis um, for one thing, but they're in general a much larger um, synthetic biology company that also focuses on um, designing other uh, proteins from scratch as well.